It's been a long time since Sporting Lisbon won the Portuguese league. So long, in fact, that the last time they won it in 2002, Cristiano Ronaldo was in their youth team, Lady Marmalade was the number one song worldwide, and Star Wars Episode Two was in theaters. It's all Obi-Wan's fault. He's jealous. He's holding me back. But that might be about to change. Sporting are first in the league, and after a draw against Porto on Saturday, the club are 10 points ahead of their Portuguese rivals. Today we ask, can Sporting Lisbon end their title drought? Sporting season has been absolutely fantastic, almost faultless, I would say. Tom Cunder is a Portuguese football journalist and the creator of Portugal.net. In the league, 20 games, 70 wins, two draws. Absolutely magnificent season. And especially as that was completely going against all expectations. The only slight uh, disappointment for Sporting was getting knocked out of Europe right at the start. But uh, that might have actually proved a blessing in disguise because... As I just mentioned, their league form has been absolutely phenomenal and that probably played a part in it. It's been 19 years since Sporting last won the Portuguese league, which they did in 2002. Why has it been so long since they've last won the league title? I think the main thing is just chronic instability running right through the club. No real kind of philosophy or plan or kind of flip-flopping between one and another. For instance, during the 2000s and the early part of um, really the end of the 90s, start of the 2000s, Sporting were known for their academy. They had a fantastic academy. Well, they still have. They're the only club in the world that has produced two Ballon d'Ors in uh, Luis Figo and Cristiano Ronaldo. And they really relied on that academy. And it was very common to see seven, eight, eight players, you know, in the first team, which had come through the academy. That was kind of swept under the carpet or that DNA, you could say, of the club was changed for a effort of buying success, buying immediate success. Uh, I think influenced by what Porto and Benfica were doing. They were making lots of buys, especially from South America, which proved very successful. Sporting tried to copy that, but they just uh, did it worse. (laughs) They just weren't able to replicate at all the success of Porto and Benfica in doing that. And, uh, And then also it kind of wrecked in some way their the prospects of their young players and so they were kind of left in a no man's land they weren't quite sure which way they could you know go about trying to catch up with Benfica and Sporting uh, sorry Benfica and Porto and uh, and that led to a lot of instability lots of infighting lots of change of presidents change of coaches almost every year and so it was just really chronic instability there was no basis on which Sporting could try and build to try and catch up with their great rivals, Benfica and Porto. Now, a lot of that infighting and instability came bubbling to the surface in May of 2018. What happened then? Yeah, that was really what has been described as possibly the darkest day in the club's history. Was uh, Sporting had endured a very uh, disappointing end to that season. Uh, when they missed out on the Champions League qualification. And uh, there was a lot of talk and a lot of instability surrounding the president at the time, a real firebrand president called Bruno de Carvalho. Now, this is a president who completely splits opinion. He did do a lot of good work at sporting. He kind of you know, made them feel relevant again. He, he was very different to previous sporting presidents in that he was... Uh, very kind of aggressive towards Sporting's rivals, whereas previous presidents had all been known as being quite kind of polite businessmen type people. He was a a former fan, a former ultra, (laughs) but he did a very good job at Sporting in many ways, kind of got the finances in order, but more than anything, really created a, a wave of enthusiasm. And Sporting seemed to be catching up with Porto and Benfica. And, you know, things seemed to be going in the right direction. But then there were a few disappointments along the way. And like I say, the end of that season, Bruno da Carvalho, who 
his one weakness, I think even his uh, supporters would say, is he really wears his heart on his sleeve and is very kind of spontaneous. And he ended up having a big fallout with the players after losing to Atletico Madrid in the Europa League. At the end of the season, as I say, Sporting missed out on Champions League qualification. And so on the 18th of May, were the shocking scenes were seen really, because this was also caught on film, where 50 of Sporting's own fans, own ultras, got together and invaded the club's famous Alcachet uh, training complex, where it's the you know the youth academy and the first team. That's where they do all their training, about uh, 20 miles outside of Lisbon. And uh, that was invaded by this group who went straight to where the first team were training and just attacked the players, attacked the coach, you know, quite violently. Some of them, you know... You, Got, got injuries. We had pictures of Baz Dos, the star striker, with his with his head cut. And that just caused absolute mayhem, as you can imagine. Lots of the players rescinded their contracts. They said, OK, that's it. This is just cause for walking out of the club. Uh, so we're talking about players who are worth millions of pounds. Obviously, players like uh, William Carvalho, Gelson. Uh, Martins, uh, Rui Patricio, uh, you know, lots of players, Portuguese internationals, who said they no longer want to be part of, of sporting. The president, uh, Bruno de Carvalho, you know, there were emergency meetings. He was kicked out of the club as well. So it just seemed that sporting were in a complete mess, you know, even more than they had been in the previous years. And some people just thought this really could be the demise of sporting as a force in Portuguese football. And so last season, Sporting finished in fourth place and 22 points behind champions Porto. And then this season, at the time of the recording, Sporting are leading the league and 10 points ahead of Porto before their game this weekend on Saturday. What has been the difference between this season and last season for Sporting? Well, that's like the $100 million dollar question I think because it really has been a bolt out of the blue it's been so unexpected you know sporting were in such a state and you have to really give tremendous credit to the coach Ruben Amarin because he has completely revolutionized the team to start with uh, as most uh, the sporting's first team this season normally it's about seven first teamers who weren't even at the club last season so you know completely different team but perhaps the most important thing he's done is he's very obviously and made a very big point of saying the young sporting players my team uh, you know this club now will be based on their on their youth products that's what we're going to base you know our future on and that's worked out a treat because there's been quite a few of sporting's young players who have played a really big role in this and uh, exciting young players and also from a financial point of view also it's it's great of course obviously because that gives sporting the potential to make big sales and get some revenue and get their finances in order uh, in the near future and i suppose more than anything what this has done it's amazing football really isn't it it's it, when it comes down to it results just mean so much and so the fact that sporting just been winning week after week after week after week unsurprisingly the infighting and the criticism has uh, you know gradually been diminishing and has actually stopped and now people all seem to be getting behind this effort and a new era for, for sporting you know is possibly on the horizon perhaps uh, we can't ignore the fact that uh, Porto and Benfica do seem to be having a, a particularly poor season in the league so it just seems to be a perfect storm for sporting at the moment. I want to take a look at their young 36-year-old manager, Ruben Amarin, that you mentioned a moment ago. He's got a really interesting backstory. You know, what can you tell us about him and how he ended up at Sporting? Well, first of all, he was a quite a decent player, you know, nothing special, nothing, you know, not one of of Portugal's great talents over recent seasons, but you know, he, he reached a good level. He played most of his career at Benfica, which is, uh, you know, straight away, that's quite a surprise that the man leading sporting to this new era apparently is someone who spent his whole career at sporting's great city rivals, Benfica, on the other side of Lisbon. And so uh, he, like I said, he had a, a, a decent career. You know, he had to be a good player to play for Benfica. He played a few times for Portugal, not many times, but uh, 
yeah, not a top player, I would say. Went into management uh, a couple of seasons ago, started off at a small club, Casapia, then got his big break when he went to Braga, uh, you know, the biggest Portuguese club outside the traditional big three of uh, Sporting Porto and Benfica. So they've been doing very well in recent seasons. Ruben Amarin, Amarin went there and he just had an incredible spell. It was a spell because it was so good that Sporting uh, ended up contracted him after I think it was just literally about two months he was at Braga. But in that time, he won something like, I haven't got the exact stats to hand, but something like 12 out of 14 games. And what was even more surprising was in those games, uh, he beat uh, Sporting a couple of times, beat Benfica, beat uh, Porto, won the Tassa de Liga, which is the Portuguese League Cup. You know, he suddenly just had a, an explosive impact at Braga. So Sporting said, yep, yeah, OK, we're going to have a bit of that. And they paid his buyout clause, which was 10 million euros. Now, that is absolutely amazing to start with. Why? Because, first of all, it makes him the third most expensive manager in football history. We're not even talking just about Portugal here in the whole of, uh, you know, in any country. No, only twice has a club paid more than 10 million to kind of buy out the contract of a of another club's coach. And a lot of people saw this as a again, you know, this caused a lot of controversy and they said this is a crazy move by the Port by the sporting board. This is yet more evidence of, you know, this club really hasn't got a clue how to run a football club. Uh, he came to Sporting, had a reasonable end to last season, but this season, you know, everything he's done has kind of justified that decision just even from a financial point of view if sporting go into the champions league you know they only have to finish second to get automatic entry into champions league that looks almost a certainty you have to say you know uh, after years without playing in the champions league you know that's i think 40 million or 50 million i think porto have made this season from being in the champions league so you know you can just see there straight away is uh, is paid back that uh, kind of gamble Sporting made on him and more. So, yeah, a really, really good coach and, you know, really probably one of Portugal's most exciting up-and-coming coaches at the moment. So Amarim did really well when he was at Braga and now you've seen him up close and personal at Sporting. What are his strengths? Is he a master motivator? Is he an excellent tactician? Is he great at working with youth? What's his strength that kind of separates him from other managers? So his tactical acumen is very interesting because he's not actually very tactically flexible. He's wedded himself to this one system, which Sporting use every single match and really in any situation they're in, which is, you know, 3-4-3, which is the free man defence uh, and the wing backs. And they, they play that system. It doesn't matter who they play against, if they're playing against the strongest team in Portugal, if they're playing against the weakest team in Portugal. And I think that has been one of the secrets of his success because it's really the team and the system which is the, you know makes it stronger than the sum of their parts. If you look at their players individually and you compare them to, for example, Benfica's squad or Porto squad, you'd probably say they were like for like. You could even say perhaps, uh, well, I think not even perhaps, I think most people certainly at the start of the season would say that Porto's and Benfica's squads you know, individually are stronger than Sporting's, but he's actually gelled this team together in a system. And he's, like I say, he uses this system in every single circumstance, which brings huge advantages. Uh, Namely, when there is an injury, a suspension, you know, these things inevitably happen throughout the season. One player goes out, the next player comes in, his replacement comes in, and there's not that much change in the performance level. Everyone knows exactly what they should be doing. And also, of course, the players themselves, uh, they play exactly the same system every week. So they're just getting better and better at it. You know, it's almost like a a perfectly old machine sporting at the moment. Defensively, especially, they've been incredibly strong this season. They've only conceded 10 goals in 20 games uh, in the league. So that's almost, I think that's almost half, you know, the the next best defensive record. And so that obviously gives them a a huge chance of winning games when when you're just not conceding. You talked about motivation there, no doubt about it. I think another one of Ruben Avarine's secrets is his his motivation and his whole 
communication, his ability to communicate both to his players and to the press and, of course, through his press conferences to the fans and uh, also going back to the players, a bit like uh, Mourinho, you know, he uses his press conferences a lot of times to to give messages to his players and he's just built a really strong unit, you know, a kind of, that they actually had kind of a lemma, they call it in Portuguese, which is a, a slogan, I suppose you can say in English, which is, uh, you know, where one goes, everyone goes. So that was in reference to one or two problems after uh, a game against Family Cal when Sporting felt they were robbed of three points at the end. And, and that uh, slogan kind of was born and it's just been growing in, in its kind of strength and its impact. And so there's a real feeling that this club is and this team and this squad are really all pulling in one direction. And that is definitely down to Ruben Amarine as well. Para a entrada de Pedro Gonçalves, o remate para o golo! Para o golo de Portugal, onde dorme a coruja! Uma bola recuperada por Fábio Vieira na entrada da área de primeira, Pedro Gonçalves. Estreia-se a marcar pela seleção. One of the main reasons they've been so successful this season is because of Pedro Gonçalves, who is an attacking midfielder, and he is leading the Portuguese league with 14 goals as only a 22-year-old. Up until July of 2019, he was actually a Wolves player for Wolverhampton Wanderers. You know, how did he end up there and how is he managing to lead the entire league in goals? He's been absolutely incredible, no doubt about it. So how did he end up at Sporting? Well, uh, like you say, he was at Wolves, of course, Wolves with their kind of Portuguese revolution there in England. You know, so many Portuguese players. And it was interesting because I didn't, really know much about him in his Wolves days. But uh, talking to some fans since then, some Wolves fans, they were saying, you know, he was always one of their best players in the youth ranks. He went to Wolves as a very young player, I think 17, 18 years old, but he never got to play for the first team. Or I think he just played once or twice just because he was very young and he was considered, you know, one to work on for the future. But he was very highly rated at Wolves. And why did he leave? Apparently, it was simply a question of being homesick. You know, we sometimes forget these footballers, uh, you know, they're globetrotting careers, they're, they're human beings as well. And apparently, you know, 17, 18 year old kid, you can kind of understand it. He just, you know, was homesick. He missed Portugal, he missed his family, he missed his, missed his friends or just didn't feel so comfortable in England. And so he came back, he came back to Portugal and he went to Family Cal last season. Uh, that's a small club who really overachieved last season. They had a, a very, very good season club from the north of Portugal and they did it mainly by bringing in lone players who all did very well and uh, Pedro Gonçalves was one of them you know he scored I think eight or nine goals last season really kind of hit the ground running we have to remember that last season was his first full season as a senior professional so you know he did really well really caught the eye in the the closed season between you know last season and this season apparently there was a bit of a, a fight for his signature between Sporting and Porto. They were after him as well, but Sporting managed to buy him. His price was considered actually quite high at the time. I think it was about €6 million Euros for 50% ownership of him, which, uh, you know, in transfers between Portuguese clubs, that's actually quite a sizable amount. But, uh, you know, it's just proved to be fantastic business. And now Sporting are obviously trying everything they can to to buy the remaining 50% because he's, uh, he's just got a huge future in front of him. He's been really consistent this season. His goal scoring has been fantastic. Very skillful player. He actually reminds sporting fans, of course, of uh, another very similar free scoring midfielder who left just about a year ago, Bruno Fernandes, who's just, uh, you know, absolutely putting up trees in England. You know, it's, it's just been amazing how that Bruno... Fernandez-shaped hole has been filled almost immediately by a player who's given pretty much the same output. Are there any other players that we should know about from the sporting side? We mentioned Pedro Gonçalves. Uh, we mentioned Ruben Amorin as the manager. Is there anyone else we should know? Like I said before, I think the secret of the success of the sporting side is kind of the whole is stronger than, than the sum of their parts. And so it's a team without too many stars. You know, Pedro Gonçalves, obviously, he he stands out just because of his incredible goal scoring from midfield. 
That said, I think there are, uh, I would say, two players who are key to the success of Sporting this season, just because of the system they play. Like I mentioned, you know, three at the back with uh, wing backs, and both wing backs have been absolutely fantastic for Sporting. Nuno Mendes, the left back, who came through the Portuguese academy, he's only 18 years old. He was given his debut by Ruben Amorim at the end of last season when he was still 17. And he's just been, uh, you know, he's an absolute gem. He's been a revelation ever since he's been in the first team. You can see he's a really, really top quality player. There's no doubts about it. He's going to have a a huge career. And on the other side, uh, you've got Pedro Porro, who is a Spaniard. Again, very young, 21, I think. He came on loan from Manchester City. Quite highly rated, but never really had managed, never got a chance at Manchester City and never really has fully fulfilled his potential until now he's been absolutely superb so those two bombing up the you know the right and the left from really the whole of the flank especially Nuno Mendes really good on his defensive duties as well but both of them going forward they've just been devastating so I definitely pick out those two but yeah if I had to pick out three players three key players to explain sporting success this season I think there would definitely be Pedro Gonçalves and the two wing-backs, uh, Nuno Mendes and uh, Pedro Porro. How sustainable is their success so far this season? Do you think that it's replicable uh, in the second half of this season? I think so. I really do think so, because... Like I say, they're not really dependent on one player. Gonçalves obviously has been very has been very good for, for Sporting, but even so, you know, his goals have dried up just a little bit in the last month or so, you know, and one or two games he's perhaps not hit the level that he was at earlier this season and it really hasn't made any difference. Sporting really looked very solid. Very solid indeed. And so I really would be surprised if if Sporting did uh, you know, have a bit of a collapse, which is really the only way they can not win this league they really have to have you know a big collapse so yeah I think you know I'd I'd be very surprised if Sporting didn't see it free from here as we've mentioned this is the best sporting side in arguably decades you're based in Lisbon what has been the response and reaction amongst fans in and around Lisbon well of course it's a little difficult to gauge because we don't have fans in the stadium and uh, we don't even really meet fans because Portugal, like in so many other places, are in, in the midst of a lockdown at the moment. And so, you, you know, it's not even a question of going to the cafes and seeing the matches there and people talking to each other. So we have to kind of resort to social media and uh, you know, have a look what the press is saying. And I think I've been quite impressed and I suppose you can kind of understand it, that sporting fans until now they really haven't gone very overboard at all you know i think this club has been has had so many disappointments has had so much really heartache and so much you know devastating results and devastating events you can say over the last especially recent history last uh, five years even in the last 40 you know sporting won the league twice at the turn of the millennium but before that they also had a very big uh, you know hiatus of 18 years without winning the leagues. So, you know, in 40 years, just about almost 40 years, Sporting have only won the league twice. So this is a club which, you know, is is really starved of success. And so you could understand the fans, you know, just going absolutely wild at the moment. But on the other hand, that's not happening at all. And I think that's not happening just because the fans are a little bit wary, you know, that, uh, you know, if any club can perhaps or going on recent history, if any club can, you know, kind of collapse here, perhaps it's sporting. Uh, I don't think that will happen. I think sporting fans are quite confident that won't happen, but they're not really kind of shouting from the rooftops at the moment. You know, when sporting do eventually wrap up this title, as seems likely, and uh, perhaps that may coincide with a little bit of a relaxing of the restrictions in terms of uh, you know, meetings and uh, perhaps even some fans in the stadium. So, yeah, I can imagine some big, big celebrations then. How would a sporting title alter the power dynamics atop Portuguese football? I do think that this could be a, a bit of a power shift. Uh, well, this could be a definite power shift, not only because 
this sporting renaissance, you can say, is largely built on, on young players, on a young coach, on kind of following the club's natural DNA, which is relying on their Alcachet training complex. And so, you know, that's a philosophy and that's a, a plan and it's a direction which everyone can relate to, you know, and which uh, you can build on year after year. And so I think it's very important that Amarine stays, you know, obviously if he continues the success, it's going to be a hot property and there's going to be lots of clubs circling around to try and get him. I think uh, for sporting, it's very important that he stays for at least one season, two seasons more, as long as possible. But if he can stay for a couple more seasons, I think that will make a big difference. And I think, you know, sporting can really give themselves a, a, a solid basis to work on. And in terms of the power shift, I think this actually could be a very good time for sporting to begin to really consolidate themselves as a club again, build themselves up. We have to remember this is a club that historically is one of the top three in Portugal and going way back in the 40s and 50s uh, was the club that dominated in Portugal. It was uh, just one title after title in the 40s and 50s. It was the most successful of the, of the big three. And, uh, and so Sporting will certainly be hoping that they can roll back the years and get to something like that level. And I think the fact that Benfica and Porto, really you cannot compare those two clubs to, to where they were even just six, seven years ago, 10 years ago. You know, they were very, very strong teams, even at European level. Now, that's not really the case. You know, they've unfortunately, I think for Portuguese football, the whole quality of Portuguese football has regressed slightly. But with those two clubs, I think there's no doubt that they are not nearly as strong as they were a few years ago. So if Sporting can build themselves up, I think they can definitely get on the same level as them to, to compete with them every season. Tom Kunder is the creator of Portugal.net and is World Magazine's Portugal correspondent. The music for this episode was provided under the Creative Commons license by Blue Dot Sessions, and you can find more information about those songs in the episode show notes. This episode was produced by myself and John McKenzie. I'm Josh Schneiderweiler. Thanks for listening to Football Today.